Hi, I am with Degarabit. My client's name, Father Godavid Kochakian, and so many of you know him. He is has been a highly spiritual pastor of our diocese, three parishes for almost 50 years. He's also been the chancellor of our diocese. And I look forward to him speaking up, because he's going to be speaking on the eternal truth. Brother, did I? Thanks, Daddy Prem. Uh, just so you know, Daddy Prem and I share that 50-year history. Uh, we were classmates in the uh, infant years of St. Nurse's Seminary, and we are so happy the seminary has grown to produce wonderful priests for our diocese. And as we as priests, we never really retire. Yes, uh, I serve three parishes, and my diocesan work, and so forth, but uh, you are a priest unto the order of Melchizedek forever and ever, and that's the eternity of our ministry as pastors and priests in the church. So whether you're in a parish leading the flock, intending the flock of God, or doing God's work in other ways, our work is never, ever completed. It's completed in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, hopefully, the good Lord willing, we make it there. Um, I want to kind of reflect on a lot of the stuff that's happening right now in the world. In 2020, the, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Charles Dickens starts out in The Tale of Two Cities, and this is the second part, the worst of times. Not, not ever in our history have we been confronted with such a multiplicity of disasters, sickness, illness, challenges, all at one time, and it's all happening now. And we watch the news, we read the papers, we try to make sense of it, and we still can't. And those of us who are blessed enough to have been spared from the calamities and the adversity of nature and the terrible pandemic that is placed upon us, we are blessed. We are thankful for that. But at the same time, we must pray for those who have been affected by it. Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus teaches us many things. And he made it so simple. He honed it down to two commandments that we as believers in him, if we are truly Christian and follow his way, we must do. The first of the two greatest commandments are to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Mm -hmm. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. God gave us this earth. We are the stewards of this earth to take care of the near perfection he created, the paradise. And then, of course, the story of Adam and Eve's fall and how humanity fouled up the works and so forth. But we're still pursuing that because Jesus says, be as perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So where does that all converge? It converges in the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John according to the New Testament scriptures, according to the admonitions from the Old Testament, it all comes together as our way of life. And so the question is, do we live our lives according to the gospel as it teaches us the eternal truth? Or do we accommodate the gospel, massage it, refashion it, accommodate it to a way that we want to live, reducing its power, its might. And I'm afraid that in the times that we live and things that we have been confronted with, presently the Black Matters Lives movement, the injustices to the minorities of this great nation in which we live and in the world as well. 
the isolation we find ourselves in from each other, the fear and the anxiety that the pandemic has placed upon us. How can we live the gospel? How can we be true to the call of Christ if we say we are baptized Christians and live the Christian way? Then there is an imperative placed upon us to get out of our skin and get into the body of Christ. It is a spiritual imperative. It is a mystical imperative. It is a social imperative to overcome the injustices that uh, exist on this earth, and especially the injustices that have plagued the United States of America for all of our history. Some people will say it's overdone, the Black, Matters, Black Lives Matter movement. No, it isn't. It's conjuring up our thinking of the way towards that perfection Jesus wants his world to be, to recover the paradise lost and to reconstitute what God has created in the best possible way. We cannot be satisfied with the present policies of paying off people to uh, satisfy an injustice. That doesn't work. Our attitudes have to change. And that's driven only by the gospel, the eternal truth. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be your brother's keeper. Have regard, respect, and reverence towards the other person because the image of God that is in us is in that person's as well. We cannot put them down. Unfortunately, the blacks in the world, not just America, America very severely but in other parts of the globe, on this planet Earth, have been oppressed. And we cannot accept that. That is unacceptable to place them as secondary citizens. Look at our own Armenian situation and the oppression and dominance we lived under during the time of the genocide and even before, oppressed by the Ottomans, who labeled us as dogs gave us no rights and privileges, disarmed us in their empire. So we as Armenians should understand very well what it means to be oppressed, what it means to be insulted, derided, jeered. That's not right. All the more, we members of the Armenian church should be even greater in our sensitivity to the call for justice. And you, you know, um, you said something that really, really struck me. Um, the, the thing about now, and the Armenians getting into this, living the gospel rather than just putting it to one side and having accommodate our life. And then you said, getting in, that we should get into the body of Christ. They hit me. They hit me. Uh, our, our primate, Sir Pazan, uh, Bishop Daniel, his mantra at the present time, his mission in his newly established episcopacy is exactly that, building up the body of Christ, mm -hmm. being open-minded, being loving, being accepting, you know, I'm, I'm truly blessed. I grew up in a, a city in Massachusetts where in my graduating class from high school, there were just two black kids. I mean, we lived, and many of us grew up in that type of a location. And I always remember my mother had friends who were black Americans at that time. They had other names that were not so gracious. And she was so kind to them and she always said, Dilas, 
<laughs> you have to be kind. They are just like you. She never mentioned a color. She never mentioned skin. But of course, she, in her great wisdom, as mothers always have, uh, shared with me, and I've always remembered that, that has been the seed. It has been an attitude planted in my head and in my heart to which, and in, by which I grew to be what I am today. And when I see the treatment and uh, abuses that occur, it's just unfair. It's not fair. It's not right. It shouldn't be that way. You know, many people, I was just talking with someone this morning, a little while ago, I had a meeting, and uh, they mentioned the fact that, this person mentioned the fact that this pandemic, we're in here for a long time to come still, and people want to get, get back to the way things were, our comforts when we could go out and hug and be with each other and do what we did. We're not supposed to go back. We're supposed to go forward. That old way in the attitude of racism, uh, systemic racism in this country and in the world, that has to be ash and burned to the ground like the fires in California are burning to the ground. That's got to be something of the past. We have to look forward to a new creation, a new time where we have learned from this horrible, bad time, something even better. Mm -hmm. So I ask a rhetorical question now, uh, but I want you to answer it anyway. Uh, is God speaking to us in everything that you've just spoken about? Is God trying to say something? What do you think? I know that would be presumptuous of you to answer, but what would you think God is saying? <laughs> I, I speak on behalf, we all, Dad, yeah. you're a clergyman, I'm a clergyman, yeah. we speak on behalf of. So yeah. I'm not the voice of God, <laughs> I'm speaking on his behalf of what I know in my limitations about him. <laughs> he is an all-loving God. He is an all-encompassing God. He cares. In Christ, he wept. In Christ, he felt everything that we as human beings feel. He knows us more than we know ourselves. Yet we have fallen to the power of evil. We say it all the time in this prayer that we start our services with and end them with. And if we forget a prayer, then just say the Our Father, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. You see, evil is at the root of everything that is happening in society today. The protests, the uh, language that is used so crudely and rudely to speak about the people of this country, the degradation that is insinuated towards people of other faiths, barring them from entry into our, come on, that's not, and don't hold the Bible up in front of the United States press as if you are living the gospel according to the truth of the gospel. You're accommodating it. Nothing else said. Yeah. I, I do not want to get political, yeah. but that's how I see it, and, and I understand it. That's not the way yeah. it was intended to be. Yes. Well, dear God, bed. I want to thank you for speaking today. Um, you know, your work is never done. As, as pastor, as priest, as a good human being. And we're going forward. And I love what you said. Going forward, loving God and loving our neighbor, making the gospel a way of life, getting into the body of Christ, into the one who cares for all humankind. And gave his life for us. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Marvelous, marvelous. So that's it, Gerhard. I could go on and on. Everyone knows that they got up once he starts talking. Hey, it's okay. I love listening to you. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'm. we're going to end this. God bless you. We're going to talk, talk offline now. God bless. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye.